Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're doing this series of Sabbath School lessons as presented by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a series covering the first quarter of 2012. It's entitled Glimpses of Our God, and this is lesson number 11 in that series from March 17 of 2012. Before we begin, would you bow your heads with us for a word of prayer? A kind and wonderful Father, we come before you to consider another aspect of your character, of your personhood. May we understand it clearly. May we see how you are an artist, an architect, a poet, an author, and many things more as we study this lesson as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know what is your favorite picture of God, what you think of when the word God is spoken, or even Jesus, or the Father, or the Holy Spirit, but I doubt that you immediately think of artist, sculptor, creator, maybe creator, author, musician. What about that? Well, it, it, in the, as the sun goes down on a nice cloudy yeah. time, uh, there's an awful lot of artistry in the sky. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Well, have you ever had the privilege of visiting a good zoo and observing all the different creatures that God has made? Yeah. Or perhaps an aquarium, like the Aquarium of the Pacific down in the Los Angeles area. Some of the creatures that God made that live in the water are positively unbelievable. There's some little things called sea dragons that look for all the world like leaves and things sticking out of them in every direction. Yeah. But they fit well into their environment. In fact, they fit so well into, your envir into their environment, it's almost impossible to identify them until, some, oh, look, it <laughs> he's <moves>. moved. <laughs> Did God make each of the millions of species we now have classified? No. 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 Oh, yes, so, he did. No. Why? Because we have lots of things now that we call species that are merely variations on a theme. Yeah, but wasn't that variation planned in the first place to unfold like a leaf? Well, like at a, least, like at least a, God... The per potential for it being yeah. there. The potential. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly, certainly Adam didn't have a chance to, to identify and name a million different species on one afternoon. I mean, that would be impossible. Well, I still think that if, if they all unfolded later, he still made them because... Oh, yeah, he, we're, not, we're not arguing about that. Well, we're, we're, okay, you're, you're talking about at a certain point of time. At, at, at the beginning of creation, yes. Yeah. Well, because we, what he said is that the, is what Darwin believed and what, what Christianity believed in his day is that everything we saw had been made exactly by God and with no variation since he made it that way. And uh, then when Darwin went out there and saw the variation of the finch species, he says, hey, this doesn't add up. Mm -hmm. But it was a, a faulty premise to begin with. Yeah. Well, back in the beginning did, uh, well, d let me just back up and say, would you say that everything that God has made as it exists in our world today, living creatures, is uh, Beautiful? Mm, beautiful's in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> <laughs> Does God make anything that's ugly? Why don't you ask him? <laughs> yeah, why, why are you even asking that question? I mean, I'm asking you. I, we're yeah, here. To it's not answerable because, mm -hmm. like he said, you know, the ugliness or whatever I, is I'm, in I'm the I'm a physician. Of, Many of you know that, and I've had the privilege in the past of delivering a lot of babies. <laughs> and some of them come out after long labors and stuff like that and a lot of trauma and so forth, looking pretty ugly, I'm afraid. <laughs> but, of course, they look much better after a few days. Um, Is that have like you ever saying thought? like a baby only a mother could love? Yeah, that sort of like mean? that, yeah. <laughs> See, it's, it's, um, it's like Norm said. It's just yeah, the, I'm the, the older, older. Yeah. Have you ever thought of God as an artist? Mm -hmm. You have, huh? What about a musician? When you hear the birds in the morning. Mm -hmm. Okay, who gave the birds their song? You know, some of you are aware that there are birds in our world that can 
that can reproduce almost any sound you can name. It's absolutely unbelievable. There's some birds down in New Guinea that can almost perfectly reproduce the sound of a chainsaw. It's just you just you just can't believe it. Chainsaw? Until, huh? <laughs> really? I mean, they hear a chainsaw, they and hear, so they repeat people it. People are people are cutting down trees in the forest, and they hear the chainsaw, and they're you know what? I mean, I can't do that, but they do it. And you, where is that? <laughs> One time we were in a forest when I was a little girl, and my dad yelled out, Joanne, Joanne. Uh, he was looking for me, yeah. and and there were birds, and I heard them say, Joanne, Joanne, Joanne. Really? <laughs> wow. Yeah. If you've ever had the opportunity of studying birds, Norm and I had that privilege. You remember the year we spent uh, every spare moment we could trying to identify as many different birds in East Africa as we could? Unbelievable. The colors and the variations and the iridescent colors and the just fantastic. Uh, Some of the looks you might think, I might haven't thought of God as an artist, but as a comic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As somebody who loves a good joke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, do you think God loves beauty? Well, yes, because when you look at those birds, why do they have to have stripes of colors? I mean, it serves really no functional purpose. Uh, sometimes it does, but other times, I think it's done for sheer beauty mm. of the, of the uh, species. There are, there, there are two big classes of birds that live in East Africa. One group is called sunbirds, and another group is called the uh, starlings. Not like the starlings we have in this country, mm -hmm. although the ones here have a little bit of iridescence. Yeah. But the ones in East Africa are just unbelievable, the colors. Um, in the San Diego Wild Animal Park, they have a few East yeah. African starlings, and yeah. some of them are just... I go down there almost just for that purpose, to, right. <laughs> to remember how beautiful the birds are That's in East right. Africa. Right. Well, in, in the U.S., they have a lot of LG, LG Bay, oh. LBJs. Oh, LBJs. Little brown jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but in, still, in, you know, people will take those things, uh, they'll carve these birds out and make little models of them, and they're beautiful, the way they, they do it, and they paint them up and things, and, and it's, just, it's just a wonderful thing to make up these models of these birds. It's interesting, the birds of color, if you look through an American, are the warblers, mm -hmm. lots of different colors. Warblers are all little brown jobs in Africa. Mm -hmm. Starlings here are just this gray, pesty thing. Over there, they're just exquisite. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> well, what about visiting art museums? You like to visit art museums. I consider humans less artistic than God. <laughs> yeah, okay. John Keats, a famous poet, once wrote, beauty is truth, truth beauty. Do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beauty is truth, truth beauty. Mm -hmm. Should we have a Christian doctrine on beauty? I don't think so. No, we don't think we need I don't that. think we need I don't think we need regulations on beauty. Just, just well, if it's connected <laughs> Leave it up to, to God. Yeah. yeah. If it's connected to truth. Uh, how would you write a doctrine on beauty? Truth is beautiful, so let's look for truth in God's yeah. word. Mm -hmm. Well, how would beauty and art or writing or music relate to our other Christian doctrines? What do you think? Well, at potluck, there has to be a certain kind of beauty or you uh, don't want to eat. Mm -hmm. Beauty is pretty we, general. I we mean, like what are you to talking about? Are you talking about things that are beautiful to the eye, beautiful to the ear? Yeah. Are you talking about when a guy forms a part, you know, for an engine, a new one, and he puts it on, and it goes on perfectly, and he says, beautiful. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. huh? So, I mean, when you talk about beauty, it goes on and on yeah. and on. Yeah. Well, think back to the time when God made our world. Some people have suggested that the accusations that Satan made against God, not being willing to share his creative power, etc., many of those accusations were answered already by the end of Creation Week. 
Here, here's, here's the Genesis 1 account. Look at Genesis 1, starting with verse 26. We're going to pick out three or four verses here. See what it says to you about God's artistic, sculpting, beauty, capacity. Then God said, and now we will make human beings. They will be like us and resemble us. Does that mean visually? They will have power over the fish, the birds, and all animals, domestic and wild, large and small. So God created human beings, making them to be like himself. He created them male and female. Then dropping down to verse 31, God looked at everything he had made, and he was very pleased. Evening passed and morning came. That was the sixth day. What you see in God in, Gen in Genesis is that God is a very organized person. So there is beauty in organization. Everything mm -hmm. was in an order. Um, it was functional. Form followed function, maybe. Mm -hmm. Well, the famous verse that we turn to in terms of dealing with human, the creation of human beings, of course, is Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God took some soil from the ground. Uh, the King James would say dust, but the Hebrew is more like clods or, or clay or something like that. And it's a little hard to imagine how you'd form dust, but clay or, or, or even a clod that you could sort of carve on, whatever, we can understand that more. And formed a man out of it. He breathed life-giving breath into his nostrils, and the man began to live. Now, many of you are familiar with the King James, and you know that it says man became a living what? Soul. Soul. And the word for soul there, uh, both the Hebrew and the Greek words, if you go to the New Testament, the words for soul just means a person. There's, there's nothing, there's not a, some kind of essence or something inside of us, as the ancient Greeks taught, that sort of escapes when we die, that sort of comes in when we were born and, and escapes when we die, that lives on forever and ever, nothing like that. It's just we begin to live. When the body and the breath are together, you have a soul. Um, now you're saying that God was holding some clay and his breath, with his breath, came the blood vessels, the eyeballs, and everything else. Now, we're talking in I, symbols here, <laughs> even back then. Yeah. I mean, you're not, you're, not seeing, you're not seeing dirt turn into, magically turn into I this am. stuff. I know, well, that's because that's all the information you got. But there's, he did a lot more than just form stuff. There's a lot of things happen molecularly and, and everything. Just think of all the chromosomes and stuff. How do you take dirt and start winding chromosomes out of well, dirt? Well, I'm saying his breath is so powerful that it created... Well, you talk about breath in <laughs> symbolic terms. I mean, you go back to just somebody who doesn't know any better. I mean, well, breath is something... When you have a dead body, he doesn't breathe. No. I mean, when you put breath in him, that means he started breathing we, and it starts working. I, He's alive. I, no, when I get to heaven, I'll ask God, I'll say, here's a piece of clay, breathe into it and let's see what you can make. And I bet he does it. Okay, I'll take you up on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I, don't, I think there'll be a lot more stuff happening and I don't even know if he'll do well, that. Here's what I want to see and, and I more <laughs> or less agree with Joanne. I think when we get there, God's going to say, okay. And in fact, I'm sure the universe watching they watched that with their, everybody's eyes were this big around. You know, they were watching exactly what God did. Spe even Satan, because he wanted to be a creator. He said, let me see if I can do that. Well, I don't, I don't think it was a magic act. No. I mean, well, there's a creation, lot of stuff Creation happened. is a magic act, period. No, 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 no. It's just, to us, it seems like a magic act. But I think, oh, but that's what now, I think it goes right into all the truth all down to the molecular, molecular God, everything. God designed the whole thing. He didn't just sort of like this. He knew exactly what he had in mind. And his, his thoughts became reality. Now, yeah. what is amazing is people today have no question that if everybody on earth started praying at once, or with whoever's praying, God can be there and Holy Spirit be with that person. A God that can do that 
why do they doubt he can do anything? I mean, uh, they believe one thing that he can do, which to me seems just as impossible as breathing into a piece of clay and his breath making blood vessels and all this well, other stuff. Well, to his make it more complicated, he did that with Adam. Now, you could say he could spend a lot of time gathering up clods and more than that and whatever. Then he had to make Eve out of a rib. Of course, he had done all of this creation on animals before that and plants yeah. before that. So yeah. this wasn't brand new. Yeah. I think with our peanut different order minds, of magnitude. Uh -huh. With our peanut little minds, uh, we think we're so smart. And even the smartest scientists think they're so smart. And I think when they're going to get to heaven, they're just going to see, they're just going to be like a special ed mm -hmm. student. I, I think know. we're going to get to see. God is going to say, okay, here's the DVD. Take as long as you want. Watch it. I mean, obviously, it's not going to be a DVD. He's got a recording system that would make us turn green, I'm sure. When the earth is made new again, now I have no doubt that if he wanted to speak one word, it could all be done. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it wouldn't surprise me yeah. to see him kind of roll it out mm -hmm. one day at a time. I'll just kind of tell you how it happened the first time. Watch, everybody, yeah. and we get to see it again. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. To me, it's to watch somebody pull a rabbit out of a hat might make you kind of impressed for a little while, but if you can see everything and you watch it over and over again and you go deeper and deeper with what he did to make that happen, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be it's going to be just continually fantastic, you know. Okay, now a Adam, when he was created, apparently realized that he was made out of dirt. That's what God says anyway. Well, his elements, the elements do you, of what Do you think material. God wanted to, Adam to realize that he was a part of this whole creation thing? And when Eve was made out of the rib, did he want Eve to say, to really understand, yes, I'm, I mean, she wasn't there when it happened. How did, she make, how did God make it very clear to her that she was a part of Adam? Adam apparently got the picture because, you know, he said those famous verses, bone of my moan and flesh of my flesh. Maybe God played the video for them. Yeah, it's possible. Maybe they believed God at that time. <laughs> well, do we believe him? We didn't see a video. We believe it. But would so. you, do you, think, do you think God was doing the work of a, a potter or a sculptor? He was doing the work of a God. Symbolically, yes. Mm. But there's way more than that. Okay. I mean, I, th I think that's, that's making it a little surface. I've never seen a potter take his beautiful creation and say, and turn it into something living. No, 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 no. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. I, d I just don't look at it that way. I guess well, it's just in, an in individual ancient, thing. You can read Jeremiah 18 and Isaiah 64 and Psalm 50. In fact, let's, just, let's look at just Isaiah 64, a few verses. Um, you welcome those who find joy in doing what is right, those who remember how you want them to live. You are angry with us, but we went on sinning in spite of your great anger. We have continued to do wrong since ancient times. All of us have been sinful. Even our best actions are filthy through and through. Because of our sins, we are like leaves that wither and are blown away by the wind. No one uh, turns to your, you in prayer. No one goes to you for help. You have hidden yourselves from us and have abandoned us because of our sins. And I have a feeling that's not the verse I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Well, the potter and clay, it's verse 8. You were coming okay. to the potter and okay. clay. Did I not get there? Oh, yes, I'm verse sorry. Eight. But you are our father, verse 8. We are like clay and you are like the potter. You created us. And so do not be too angry with us or hold us our, our sins against us forever. We are your people and be merciful to us. Sorry, I quit reading too soon, didn't I? Um, but there are other places in the Old Testament, Jeremiah um, 18, Psalm 51, where it talks about God creating us in various ways. Um, it's interesting to notice that, that potters were a very essential part of the uh, environment in ancient times um, because they needed pots for cooking, they needed pots for storing things, with, put a lid on, store it, they needed pots for for carrying, they needed pots for every kind of thing, and it turns out that those pots have become very, very important in another way in modern times. Who can tell me what it is? Archaeology. Archaeology, why? 
Well, because they made them differently, kind of uniquely in every little area and every little bit of time. Yeah, and it so kept changing over time and so mm -hmm. forth. So they can, uh, archaeologists, dig up those little, even a small piece of a pot, they can often say, this is exactly a pot that came from a certain time period in a certain place, and it helps them to sort of, you know. And of course, there's broken pieces of pottery everywhere because there were so many pots being used all the time. Of course, pots don't deteriorate like no. everything else. So yeah, uh, if that's they're, a good thing about pots. Yeah, if they're if they're made properly back in the beginning. Yeah. Well, potters only work with non-living material. The potters we know about anyway. And now, of course, we've got big machines that crunch out things with. We don't need a human being to do it. God wants us to mold. He wants to mold us rather, not only in our mother's wombs as fetuses. But also he wants to create new hearts and right spirits within us. You remember uh, David's famous words in Psalms 51.10, Create a pure heart in me, O God, and put a new and loyal spirit in me. Do not banish me from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. So if we allow God to work with us, can he produce beautiful souls? Souls being a name for another name for what? Persons. Oh. Enoch, Enoch, he certainly did. Mary Magdalene. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll discuss her a little bit more a little bit later. Rebecca or, yeah. Ra or Rahab, excuse me, Rahab. Is God more concerned about our physical appearance or about our characters? Inside the cup, he said, he's yes. more concerned. Yes. So how does God make a beautiful character in a human being? And now there's the magic. I mean, mm. we, we give our will to him, mm -hmm. and then by his grace, he makes a change in us. Now, the mechanics of that, I don't have any idea about. Well, by beholding, we become changed. Yes. God sends us truth, and that's beautiful to us, and we um, want to follow truth. You almost have to... But even that formula is, is incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. You have to experience to understand truth, though. Don't um, you think? Hmm? Don't you have to experience to understand truth? I mean, if you don't know the words, um, there's no meaning to it. And even if you know the words and, and don't commit, it doesn't help, it doesn't do any good. You There's this you paragraph. Have to, you have to go through a lie before you understand the truth? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. I'm just saying that if I say apple, you know what I'm talking about because you've seen an apple before, you've touched one and everything. If I said apple but, and you've never seen an apple in your life, it's meaningless to you. But God talks to us in the experiences we've had, right? Yeah. I think so, yeah. yeah. Well, there's, there's a very, very important paragraph found in Great Controversy, page 555. It's up there on the screen. I'd like to just read it to you. It gives us some very interesting insights into how this actually happens. It is a law, both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature, that by beholding, we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than his standard of purity or goodness or truth. If self is his loftiest ideal, he will never attain to anything more exalted. Rather, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of God alone has power to exalt man. Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. So um, that's pretty scary. Well, it shows, it shows why idol worship is just a nowhere type of situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, how high are you going to go higher than a dumb idol, something carved out of wood, yeah. even if it's shaped nicely? But, but let's... You've got God that, that just keeps going, you know? Let's think about this. What God is saying is, I need time to work on your brain. I need your attention. I need you focused on what's really important not focused on what's going on in the latest movie, not focused on what's going on in some novel, not focused even on what's going on in the news, 
but focused on God, focused on the scriptures, focused perhaps on the writings of Ellen White, focused on that which is uplifting. And God says, if you're focused on that, then I can use that information as it streams into your brain, I can use that to gradually mold your character. Well, you know, we can see this all the time, parents, when they're raising kids. They've got to put them in a good environment around good kids, around healthy foods. I mean, working in a public school, when a student from some of the local Christian schools came in for their work permit, I could just tell that they were different just by the way they walked and talked and they had been in a different environment. And, you know, sad to say, some of the public schools are getting rough. But even in the public school, if you keep your kid around a good group, very important for parents to do that. So God is just a big parent and saying, as an adult, you have to, mm -hmm. you are not mature enough to handle pornography. You're not mature enough to go into a bar. You're not mature enough to do that. You're just gonna turn into a big bratty kid. I, I submit that you can start out pretty low with faith and looking towards God that, you know, you were talking about you gotta choose the good things, but even the good things, you need to find out what they are. Mm -hmm. And God even teaches that. So, you know, um, it starts even at the bottom with him, no matter how close to the bottom you are, how far to the bottom you are. Uh, we need to talk about some of the other aspects of what's going on in this lesson. Look at Exodus 25, starting with verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to make an offering to me. Receive whatever offerings they, they wish to give. And it goes on to all the details down through verse 9. The point is, God says, I want them to make me a sanctuary out here in the wilderness. And God apparently gave Moses very very, and we have it recorded in a number of chapters in Exodus and so forth and on in Leviticus and so forth, a lot of detail. In fact, there's more detail about the construction of the tabernacle, the tent, and the writings of Moses than any other one subject. And so why, why all that detail and, and did, did God actually give Moses some kind of a, I mean, did he give him these details about the working plans on a, on a tablet of stone or did he, did he, well, how did, or did he expect Moses to remember these details? Well, in one of the books, doesn't it say, your way is in the sanctuary, O Lord? That's, that's in Psalms, actually, which was written a long time later. And the sanctuary is ignored by a lot of religions, but when you study the sanctuary, it is, it describes how God is gonna save us step by step by step by step. It's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, on the topic of how did Moses get the information, God also said that he gave certain men mm -hmm. knowledge and skill yep. to, to do the things that Moses was going to ask for. And even their descendants had those skills years later when, when so right. Solomon was looking for somebody to build his tabernacle. So I suspect that it was put into his mind, not handed to him on a stone or on a piece of paper. So God sort of said, I think so. Okay. Anybody else have an idea? Do you all agree that that's the way God does it? That, that he just poured it into his mind? Well, I, I think they talked about it, but what was necessary, God gave him. You know, we as Adventists have suggested, we've talked a lot about the sanctuary. We've suggested that the sanctuary, I mean, basically that pattern out there in the wilderness was based on the sanctuary in heaven. And that idea is reinforced by many references in the book of Revelation. Um, what's that supposed to teach us? Was God trying to tell us that he enjoys or he appreciates a, a, a nice, a, quality building, a beautiful building? Well, it's, well, the other thing that's interesting is that some people are saying that back then everything was pretty concrete, that they, that they believed, like if they believed that there was a, a room up there with, with hail in it up in the sky, they actually thought there was a, a room up there. But, you know, looking at this sanctuary, they must have had sophistication as far as symbols go to try to understand them. So, I'm not so sure that 
that they were that concrete with everything. At the, at the very least, they were supposed to learn that they could, that their sin problem could be saved, could be, could be solved. And sins could be separated and sent off to That's no right. They didn't have to worry about those if they met the, the, the criteria. Mm -hmm. And there's probably not much more <laughs> that needs to be given than, yeah. than, than that. Uh, obviously, there were a lot of symbols, but it seems like all of them pointed to Christ. Yeah. And well, he is the only mechanism by which it happens. Did they realize that with every sacrifice that they did? Every probably dove, not, every lamb? Probably not, but I suspect that the farther they got into it, if they had studied and if they had responded, they would have understood it. There's something very interesting about the ending, about the way that thing was constructed, found in the last few verses of, of Exodus. Look at, look at Exodus 40, starting with verse 34. And it's, actually, let's back up a little bit, and you, you'll see, if you, if you just scan the section before that, it's talking about getting everything ready, and, and, and the tent ready, and, got, and, and Moses having carefully gone through all the procedures for sanctifying the priests, etc. And then it says, Then the cloud covered the tent, and the dazzling light of the Lord's presence filled it. Because of this, Moses could not go into the tent. Now this is the Moses that just a few chapters before it described he's come down from the mountain after having spent two different sessions of 40 days with God and when he came down his face was so shining so bright he had to wear a veil to, so that people could look at him. Even that Moses couldn't go into this, to this tent because God's glory filled it. There were a lot of watch in there. God, and God apparently was saying he approved. Yeah of what was going on there. Right. And, <clears throat> and how important it was. Yeah. Well, well, one thing that would would happen from this for sure, they wouldn't later on think that Moses was some sort of God. Yeah. That he was God, mm -hmm. you know, because he himself couldn't even approach. Well, let's talk about some of the other aspects. In the days of David, as he's preparing materials and getting everything ready for the the temple that was going to be built by Solomon, we read in 1 Chronicles 23, verses 1 to 5, he had 38,000 priests assigned to serve in the temple. Now, there's no way you can deal with that many people at one time. So he divided it up, up into 24 different groups. You can read about that if you go on reading on to chapter 24 and 25. 24 different groups that rotated, every, a, new, a new group every couple of weeks through the year. Um, and many of those men were skilled musicians. It talks about cymbals, and it talks about trumpets, and it talks about um, harps, uh, whatever they were in those days. What do you suppose those instruments were like? Did God give them any music, or did they have to, con to make their own music? You know, having 38,000 allowed a lot of people to be a participant in what was going on and feel like they belong to the whole process. Mm -hmm. well, are you worried about whether this, this band was squeaky or something? If it well, I mean, if you're making instruments out of animals' horns, which are the only trumpet kind of things that we know about from ancient times, I mean, you take a hundred of those and they're different lengths and different sizes. I mean, what kind of a sound is that going to make? It might have been beautiful. I don't know. Maybe they got different sizes ones, like they have different sizes bell, and they made a bell choir out of horns tooting. Maybe that's what I'm asking you. What I mean, that's possible. I have no idea. <laughs> well, what they certainly had was was human voices, and yeah. human voices probably had the same talents back then as they do today, or more. Yeah. Maybe yeah. not all the techniques, but. Uh, I suspect yeah. they, they sang very well. We know that many of the songs, the psalms, if I can pronounce it very distinctly, recorded in our, our Bibles were actually songs originally and probably put to music. Some of them talk about, you know, mm -hmm. to the tune of such and such and such a thing. Um, unfortunately, we've lost all of that music. We have no idea what those tunes sounded like. We'd love to know. But the psalms themselves, the authors who wrote the poetry, do we, know, do we know anything about them? We sometimes sort of 
flippantly say that David was the author of the Psalms. Well, he wrote a, somewhere around 75, but there are 150 Psalms. So he wrote no more than half. Who wrote the others? Any idea? Solomon wrote some People with talent. People with talent. There you go. Well, it turns out that the, there, were, there were Psalm writers all the way from Moses to people at the time of the exile in Babylon. So the book of Psalms covers, what is that? that more, well, it's more than a thousand years of, of history. People contributed to that songbook in the, in the Old Testament. Well, you can be sure that they're not all in there. I mean, there are other Psalms. Yeah. Well, we know, it, it, it just says, uh, uh, let's see if I, can, if I can spot the place here real quick. If you look at, um, if you look at 1 Kings 4, I believe it's 32. If I can get in my Bible to do that. Let's try again. He composed 3,000 proverbs yeah, and more than 1,000 songs. This is just talking about just Solomon alone. He composed 3,000 proverbs and more than 1,000 songs. Well, we have about less than 500 of his proverbs, and we have maybe two or three of his songs. Where are all the rest? It goes on to say, he spoke of trees and plants from the Lebanon cedars to the hyssop that grows on walls. He talked about animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. Kings all over the world heard of his wisdom and sent people to listen to him. Uh, people wrote things down in um, Solomon's day, right? Yes. So they just disappeared. Presumably, yeah. What, what role do you suppose God had in composing the words of the Psalms, the music of the Psalms? Did he inspire the people or did he give them the words? What about that? Did he inspire poets or did he say, here, take your pen and let me dictate to you? Maybe he did both. There's some very interesting psalms. Uh, one of the most interesting ones is Psalm 119. Now, if you have a King James version of the Bible, you will notice that every eight verses, there's another letter of the Hebrew alphabet. If you ever notice, it's Aleph, Beth, Gamal, Delith, Hay, Delith, Hay, Wow, and so forth. Um, and you wonder why that is. Is this just a division? No, it isn't just a division. If you were reading that psalm in the original, you would discover that the first eight letters, the uh, first eight verses, I'm sorry, begin with the letter Aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The next eight verses, every one of those verses begins with Beth, which is the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. Um, for a second, I'm confusing with myself with the, with the Greek. Um, and all the way through to the end. So the Psalm 119 is eight verses from each letter of the Hebrew alphabet all the way through to the end. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. What, what do we call that? We call that an acrostic. And there are other acrostics in, the, in, the, uh, in, in, Paul, in Psalms, but not quite so exotic as that. That was probably to help them to be able to memorize it Let's see, what letter is it that it this starts with? And mm -hmm. yeah, there are eight of them, and then I'll go to the next letter. And Which so it was, it brings us to Yeah, we, we just a moment ago talked about the authorship. This brings us to a question. If you're reading through the Bible, especially in the major prophets, you will see expressions like, the Lord spoke to me, or thus saith the Lord God, something like that. Are those, you think those, at least those passages, are direct quotes from God? In English. Well, I mean, understanding that I've translated and so forth, but what are the original Hebrew, let's say? Was it a direct quote from God? You mean like from a mouth talking? Well, I mean, why would it, what, what did the prophet mean when he said, thus saith the Lord God? Well, does it, does it have to be from a mouth to make that correct? Well, I, it doesn't have to be from a mouth, I don't think, but it probably would have to mean well, that that's he, your question, he, heard the, he heard the words. However God forms them, he heard those words. Heard the words? Mm 
That's what it sounds. I mean, that's what it sounds like. It goes into your eardrums, which turns into electrical impulses, which goes into your brain. Yeah. Why can't he just make the impulses go into the brain? He can, but the question—the question—that's not the real question. I, I know all those details. What my question is: Can I look at those passages and say these are words not from the prophet, but directly from God? Can you tell us what you think? Because I have no idea. <laughs> well, yeah. you, you mean well? Who else could it be from? Well, I, I, does it make any difference? Could it be if it is an inspired person who is has a concept that God has given him, whether it be verbal words or just a concept, mm -hmm. and he puts that into human language, we 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 look at that and we and we try to ascertain the idea that God had for that person. And we call it the Word of God. Right. The whole thing, we call it the Word of it's God. It's inspiration. Yeah. Caleb? I say it's the, it's a giving authority to who it's coming from. Mm -hmm. Thus saith the Lord, not in these words, but this is what He is telling us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it's giving uh, the authority to God, not this is what I'm thinking we should yeah. do. But uh, uh, that doesn't say that it, it might, uh, could well have happened that like it, John the Revelator says, I heard the number 144,000, and I turned around and saw a great multitude. So yeah. uh, obviously there was, it sounds like there was something oral that he yeah. heard. Yeah. Well, you know, when you're doing something or you're, I don't know, and sometimes you get a Bible quote coming into your head that seems to answer what you were thinking about or the question. Mm -hmm. Now, is that a thought from God? Yes, I would think so. Well, it's interesting that here's a Bible that was created, or however what form you want to call about, think about, over a period of about 1,500 years. And yet, it just holds together beautifully. Literary scholars have created courses being taught in universities around the world, considering the literary qualities of the Bible. Now, if you go to some, some ancient sources, they're, they're pretty, pretty poor quality. But they look at the Bible and they say, you know, there's, there's university courses just saying, look at the beautiful literature we have here in Scripture. And those people may not believe that the Bible is inspired at all. They may not even believe that God exists. But they recognize the beautiful literature that's there in the Bible. What does that tell us about God's appreciation of beauty and about his skills as an artist and a poet and a musician, for that matter? Well, no human book has even come close to lasting as long, hanging together, being consistent as the Bible. No human has written a book. Even when you have the devil doing everything he, he can do to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the exactly. devil hasn't even inspired a book to be as great as the Bible. Absolutely. The best he can do is Darwin's theory. <laughs> Well, it's interesting that there are other books in the Bible that follow other patterns. The book of Revelation, for example, and, and the, the Song of Solomon are chiastic books. That is, they're shaped like a big V. You start out with an introduction, and then the, the author goes further and deeper and deeper and deeper into the subject until finally gets to the middle of the book, and there's the key passage that he really wants you to focus on. Then he starts back, and uh, the next piece matches the previous piece and so forth back up. So when he gets to the final passage in the book, it matches more or less the words or ideas from the introduction of the book. So you have a big V that going down and then back up like this. How difficult would it be to, to write something like that? It must have been quite a challenge. You that thing is called a chiasm. From Revelation is like that? The book of Revelation is like that? So where is the point where it goes to the middle? Revelation 12, 12 13, and 14. The, the, the great controversy. That's the point. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it would, would be. Yeah, it would require a fair amount of planning to do that. Mm -hmm. Also, especially if it was talking about the future and things did, did go according to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. But it is a known style. Mm -hmm that was used in non-sacred literature also, was it not? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, look at Romans 11, 33 to 36. How, this is Paul, he, he's, in his first eight chapters, he talks about the plan of salvation and how people are saved. And he basically says, we are saved by faith and it doesn't matter what our background is, 
if we have faith, we'll be saved. The Jews in his audience weren't real happy about that. They thought they should have some special advantages because they were descendants of Abraham. And so in chapters 9, 10, and 11, he focuses on those issues. He talks about how God relates to those Jews, many of whom had turned away from him by that time. And he says, let me tell you about some of the advantages that they had, some of the riches and so forth that those Jews had given to them. So here's his final comments talking to the Jews. How great are God's riches? How deep are his wisdom and knowledge? Who can explain his decisions? Who can understand his ways? As the scripture says, who knows the mind of God, of the Lord, I'm sorry. Who is able to give him advice? Who has ever given him anything so that he had to pay it back? For all things were created by him, and all things exist through him and for him. To God be the glory forever. Amen. So that's quite a testimony from, from Paul. All things were created by him, and all things exist through him and for him. So, and of course, we would all agree that the scriptures were written at the direction of God, uh, that they were created by him in some respects. But going back to the beginning again, when God molded Adam and later Eve into beautiful human beings, how much information do you think he planted in their brains? How much information is planted into the brain of a baby? Yeah. The baby isn't taught English, but it has the capability to learn English or Chinese or Spanish or mm -hmm. Russian or all of those. But, but when Adam and Eve came forth, they were already speaking. And they comprehended enough to name animals and do other kinds of things. They knew how to react to each other. But all of creation was created with apparent age mm -hmm. and the ability yeah. to be an adult. Yeah. I mean, trees didn't have to grow from seeds. Yeah. I mean, I mean, so the, when he created a tree, it looked like it was 300 years old or whatever. I don't know. But Adam and Eve not only looked like and could talk like adults, they were actually able to intelligently commune with God. Yes, and, and had the capacity for learning an infinite amount more. Yeah that they much. weren't given at that time. And, mu and very much more quickly than we have, are yeah. able to learn yeah. or assimilate. I think quickly is the key. Yeah. Because that's, that, that may be the difference between now and then. You know, how quickly they can see and take in things. But, um, you know, you, you got a pretty good description there. I, I don't know exactly where you're getting it from. I mean, how, uh, how adult were they? How much of adult were they? Were they still like children? In some ways. In some ways, yeah. So it's kind of hard to know they didn't have exactly what we, would, what we would call experience. Even their language, we don't know how much language yeah. they had. I mean, they they started. I doubt that they had communicate. trouble communicating. They probably learned from the angels very quickly, or from God directly, very quickly in a matter of minutes. Here, here's a question for you: Would it be more difficult? for God to create a perfect human being out of nothing, as we presume he did back in the beginning? Or would it be more difficult for him to take a damaged piece of something like me and make a perfect human being out of it? Damaged into perfect. Yeah. And I think people who restore cars probably work harder than the people who put a new car together. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, Either it, one. It's creative. It makes no difference whatsoever to God. Oh. No difference. He, he, no. Just, he just checks out the old the whole stuff. The, the remaking you is a creative act. Uh -huh. So he can do that in one fell swoop, or he can take it over time. I, it's Your his personality business. personality and who you really are is still there. Uh -huh. we, 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 yeah. He has to value your freedom, otherwise yeah. he wouldn't. Well, it appears to me like he, he always starts it out kind of way back where it starts and then you start growing out from there and you make your own choices who you become what you become and um, which you, what your interests are going to be it isn't like he just you know you're born with it all of a sudden and all of a sudden you've got you're as smart as a as as somebody who lived 
you know, a hundred years, only you've only lived for two minutes. You know, there's got to be something about experience that's important. Can God make something beautiful out of something ugly? Oh, yes. Yeah, he's demonstrated, and, that, <laughs> and that's why we call him God. Yeah. You know, that is God's specialty, that's and right. I think that shows in the Bible again and again and again and again and again. That is where God is shows what he really, his heart. And the, the, the best example of that is what he will make out of this experiment with sin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and have a universe that is absolutely secure against it forevermore, even though the people still are free. Think of some of the stories where God did something. started out with somebody who was probably in pretty bad shape and made something pretty remarkable. Look at the story of Jacob, for example. Look at Genesis thir 32, starting with verse, 20 in, in, in ver verse 22. That same night, Jacob got up, took his two wives. Now, he's, he's been working for Laban for 20 years, more or less, and he realizes that Laban's going to take more and more advantage of him. Maybe even Laban's sons would come along and kill him to, to recapture Jacob's wealth. But didn't Jacob double-cross his brother? Is yes. This? Yeah, so he, he was a, a double-crosser. Re reaping the results of his conniver behavior. Conniver and a... Okay. Okay. That same night, Jacob got up, took his two wives, his two concubines, and his eleven children and crossed the river Jebuk. After he had sent them across, he also sent across all that he owned. But he stayed behind alone. Then a man came and wrestled with him until just before daybreak. When the man saw that he was not winning the struggle, and knowing what we know about who it was, that's an interesting statement, he struck Jacob on the hip, and it was thrown out of joint. The man said, let me go, daylight is coming. I won't unless you bless me, Jacob answered. So who else had realized who he was, argue, who he was wrestling with? Jacob. Jacob must have recognized who he was wrestling with. And who was he wrestling with? Well, that was the question he wanted to know. What is your name, the man asked. Jacob, he answered. The man said, you will, your name will no longer be Jacob. You have struggled with God and with men. And you have won, so your name will be Israel. And what does Israel mean? If you can look in the Bible here, if you have a, something with a little, the name sounds like the Hebrew for he struggles with God or God struggles. Okay. And Jacob, of course, responded, okay, now I've told you my name. You want to change my name. Now tell me your name. But he answered, why do you want to know my name? Then he blessed Jacob. Jacob said, I have seen God face to face, and I'm still alive. So I named the place Peniel. The sun rose as Jacob was leaving Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Even today, the descendants of Israel do not eat the muscle which is on the hip joint, because it was on this muscle that Jacob was struck. Hmm. And what does Peniel mean? Peniel means, and I quote, sounds like the Hebrew for the face of God. Okay. Well, okay, let's try somebody else. You remember the story of David's sin. But, uh, what, what was your point in that story? The point of that story is we know what Jacob came from. Yeah. And now he's come to the place where he, he can wrestle with God, and God says, you know, you, you have reached the place where you struggled with God, and you've overcome. You, you have become my ideal of of a person. An example of God working with him over time and now he's yeah. got a product. Yes. Yeah. And you remember the story of, of David and his sin with Bathsheba and so forth and, and Nathan coming to him and said, you are the man and David then in the process of his weeping and, and all of his behavior. David took his friend's wife and had his friend killed. Yeah. And I don't have time to read all of it, but you know the Psalms 51, we already read a little part of it. Mm -hmm. Create a pure heart in me, O God, and put a new and loyal spirit in me. And we could go on. I, I realize we're running out of time. Peter and Luke 22, you remember his denial and then he, what he became. And Paul, look at the time when the light struck him down. Uh, one of the mo most amazing stories of transformation in the Bible is the story of Mary Magdalene. Let me read a couple paragraphs from Ellen White's book, Desire of Ages, page 568. Mary had been looked upon as a great 
sinner. But Christ knew the circumstances that had shaped her life, which she elsewhere says, Mary had been led into sin by her own uncle, Uncle Simon, the man who later had leprosy and was healed by Christ. He might have extinguished every spark of hope in her soul, but he did not. It was he who had lifted her from despair and ruin. Seven times she had heard his rebuke of the demons that controlled her heart and mind. This is a woman who was seven times demon-possessed. She knew how offensive his sin to his unsullied period, and in his strength she had overcome. When to the human eyes her case appeared hopeless, Christ saw in Mary capabilities for good. He saw the better traits of her character. The plan of redemption has invested humanity with great possibilities. And in Mary, these possibilities were to be realized. Through his grace, she became a partaker of the divine nature. She went from what? Demon-possessed Demon to what? Divine nature. divine nature. The one who had fallen and whose mind had been a habitation of demons was brought very near to the Savior in fellowship and ministry. It was Mary who sat at his feet and learned of him. It was Mary who poured, out, poured upon his head the precious anointing oil and bathed his feet with her tears. Mary stood beside the cross and followed him to the sepulcher. Mary was first at the tomb after his resurrection. It was Mary who first proclaimed a risen Savior. In the story of Mary, we see someone who made just about as a big a transformation as you can possibly imagine from demon possession to divine likeness. Well, are we willing to let God mold us? Again, I, I read from the writings of Ellen White. This is volume five of the Testimonies, page 537. Let the converting power of God be experienced in the heart of the individual members, and then we shall see the deep moving of the Spirit of God. Mere forgiveness of sin is not the sole result of the death of Jesus. He made the infinite sacrifice not only that sin might be removed, but that human nature might be restored, rebeautified, reconstructed from its ruins, and made fit for the presence of God. So what is our role as parents in dealing with, with children? What is our role with other church members that we have a chance to influence? What should be the purpose of good divine inspired music and architecture and words what tools does god use to mold our characters what should we use um, there are many more things that could be said god came down and blessed the tabernacle tent we talked about that he, he in, in, inhabited the solomon's temple but later he came down in person as a quiet human being and taught the gospel and that was his ideal. Read about it in Haggai 2.9. I hope you've enjoyed talking about God as an artist, a sculptor, and a musician. See you next week.